กันรองไฮ guys I'm gonna give y'all a minute to take a look at this view right here of our glass cabinet at Grey Ghost Vineyards well there's a number of glass cabinets we had a very interesting question come in from last week hi Caitlin first one checking in Lisa nice to see you so happy to have you all with us today Scott McKenzie how you doing buddy I heard mom exclaim in excitement when I read your name off. So we're coming back over here to the glass cabinet. You know, we're getting ready for that walk upstairs. Thank you all for all of your support this past week. We have really, truly appreciated it. Hi, Chris. Hi, Mikhail's. So I know, hi, Rulinda. I know y'all want to see my face. So I have to tell you, something amazing came in the mail today to my friends Charlie and Sue up in Pennsylvania. Apparently the Golden Ring Society nominated me, the executive producer, as the first ever winner, check this out, of the Golden Ring Award, the Triple Golden Ring Award. How cool is that? Charlie and Sue, while I am completely humbled by this honor and it was so exciting to check the mail today, I must tell you this is a group effort. And I can't possibly take credit for all the hard work of Al and Cheryl. I'm really just trying to corral these celebrities. So we're getting upstairs. And if you have followed us this past week, you know that Thursday was a little bit stressful because our phone lines were down because of all the rain. So maybe Cheryl will fill us in about what happened with the phone lines this week. Oops. Oh. oh, we got Carola and Dave, Larry and Fran checking in. I saw Christopher Murray showing up. All right. We, oh, we are back again. Wait, I, I didn't see it. The happy half hour with Al and Cheryl Keller. Let's see those applause. I left my applause sign downstairs. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Am I on? Yes, you're on. <laughs> well, thanks. I can hear the applause from here. And this is just so heartwarming to know that we're now attracting literally millions of people every day, anxiously anticipating these half, half, happy half hour at Grey Ghost, at Grey Ghost Studio One. Thanks for joining us for our fifth live performance. As you will note behind us, we have created an audience today. We're anticipating at some point in time, things will be normal enough that we can have a live audience at these programs. But until that happens, we put this audience together so that Cheryl and I can get over stage fright. So that's very critical. Now, once again, like we mentioned last week, this is relation building. On a serious note, I cannot begin to thank each and every one of you for the incredible support we've had over these last weeks. And I, I just, seriously, I'm speechless. We've been at this thing for 25 years, and with everything you all have done to support us, I think we're going to make it to 26. So thank you very much. Now, by popular demand, here comes the joke of the day. I don't know if you heard about the time when the Pope, visit, Pope visited the United States. And when he got off the plane and got into his limo, he thought, what a wonderful country this is. I wonder what it would be like to drive. So he talked his chauffeur into allowing him to drive the, the, show, uh, the limousine. As soon as he got in, he put the pedal down and got it up to 80 miles an hour. Of course, the cop immediately pulled him off, came around the corner, take a look at him and running back to his car, radioed into headquarters and said, I think I've just stopped a very, very important person. And headquarters said, how do you know? He said, it's because the Pope is the chauffeur. Okay, <laughs> enough of that. Once again, it's time for Cheryl to give you an update on what has been transpiring over the week. And of course, the critical thing to do that is to have wine in your glass. So Cheryl is gonna make sure she's pouring her wine. And now, Cheryl, would you give a little bit of a background and detail on the exciting things that you experienced this week? Mm. 
as usual. Cheryl, I could not have said it better myself. <laughs> now, the happy half hour today, our wine is the Victorian Red, which is an off-dry rosé. Now let's make sure we get all five glasses filled here. And again, as you know, for our, for our own personal safety, we're drinking from two wine glasses, one in each hand. This is extremely critical. Now, a little bit about the wine itself. This is a blend of Cabernet Franc and Chardonnay. The Cabernet Franc has been fermented to dryness. The Chardonnay that we use in this is our Victorian White. As a result, it's a little drier than the Victorian series. It represents 35% Chardonnay, 65% Cabernet Franc. If you note the color, it's a little deeper than a lot of rosés you see, but if you compare it against our full-bodied wines, you can picture it right away as being a very light-styled wine. We treat it like a French rosé. We do serve it chilled. The beauty of this wine is its versatility. It can literally go with just about everything. I think the only thing I'd shy away from is a prime rib or a steak. There I'm going for my Cabernet. But it's delightful as a food wine with seafood, with poultry, a hamburger. As you all know, we have a little bit of a deer problem here, so Cheryl and I enjoy this with venison chili. A little bit of a background on the wine itself. When we first got started, all of the reds we produced were full-bodied, dry reds. But we as we developed, we soon began to realize that people have different tastes. So it took us two years to create the Ranger Reserve, a rosé. And when we first started, it was a much sweeter wine. Today, as I mentioned, it's more off dry. So here's to the uh, Victorian Red. There's a lot of people drinking Victorian Red with us tonight, guys. Wow, that is one great wine. Okay, so let's continue. First we're gonna do is give a little bit of an update on the vineyard. Uh, a lot of you were aware with, with us last week when we informed you of the severe damage we had in the Chardonnay. And if you can remember, I said it was going to take about a week for us to get a better picture of the damage. It went from about 95% down to about 60, and it may be lower than that. Right now, we're waiting for some of the shoots to show fruit. If they show fruit, then the primary buds made it. If they don't, then they're secondary buds. Also, we spent this week cleaning trunks, brushing off the little buds off the trunk so that all the energy will go to the shoots that are on the cordon. And in the winery, the big effort went into bottling of the Cabernet Franc. Although this is going to be released in on uh, Father's Day, it is available for sale. Amy made sure of that. Also, we're starting the spray regiment this week. It looks like Monday will be the first spray, which actually was delayed due to the cool weather we've had. Do you all have any questions concerning what's transpired at Grey Ghost, both in the vineyard or in the winery? Right now, we're just getting a lot of people checking in with all the yummy stuff that they're drinking tonight. And a lot of people have their Victorian Red open, so thank you guys, we really appreciate that. Well, now what we're gonna do is go with questions from last week. And what we really love, I hope you'll keep it up, uh, when you have a question, they will be answered, whether it's on the show or the following week. It really gives us an opportunity to kind of take a look at your interest, and then we'll follow up on it. JC, you ask, how long can we hold a save all? If you remember, the save all is one of the wines that uh, was actually aged in oak, Hungarian oak, and therefore can last a little longer than a stainless steel white. So I'd give it a good four to five years and it'll still stay very fresh. Do I have another question? Yes, so we just had Chris Murray check in and he said, if you lose some production on the Chardonnay, if so, will you try to make it up by getting fruit from another source? 
That's a good question and the answer is no. We've made a commitment now that all of the wines we produce are going to come off of our vineyard. So if the production goes down, it means it goes down on uh, with our grapes. We've uh, basically shied away from growers as a lot of times growers and wineries don't have the same objective. And our objective, of course, is quality. But very good question. Now, Mary asked a great question about when we started the commemorative glasses. And that's an awesome one. Years ago, I used to do a lot of travel. And one time I was out on the West Coast and stopped at Marisou, where I would get one case of one of their very great Cabernets. And happened to notice that they had three logo glasses, each one dated, representing a specific event that they, they had going on. Came home and talked to Cheryl about it. And said, you know, that's an incredible idea. If we start something like that, that could be a memory that people would carry on the rest of their life. So our first Christmas glass was at the first open house in 1995, our second year of operation. And then the first Valentine's Day glass was introduced in 2001. And by the way, 2001 was the very first Valentine's Day program featured by a winery, and that was Grey Goose. Great question. Did I have another one coming up? So first, I'll let Deanna know that the Cabernet Franc that you had at the barrel tasting is what Al was just referencing that was bottled this week, and yes, it is available for sale. Barbara Allen, quick shout out. We are so excited that you are able to have wine tonight. We know that you haven't been able to the past two weeks, so that's awesome. Now, Karen, I don't know if you want to address this tonight or save this for next week. She asked, what would you have done if you hadn't gone into the winery business? Can I wait for next week? Yes, we will wait for next week. Karen, you're just going to have to tune in next week. Now, Larry had a great question about uh, doing reds in stainless steel. We do not do any reds in stainless steel. Quite frankly, a red cannot age in stainless steel. That's a neutral container. The only red we do in stainless steel is the Cabernet Franc that goes into our Victorian red. Otherwise, the aging process gives us the ability to soften those wines. Dave asked a great question about Colonel Mosby. If he showed up, and I wish he would, what wines would we offer him? Well, that was a no-brainer. It's the Ranger Reserve. Nothing would be nicer than that. And when he got ready to leave, we'd give him the adieu. Of course, we'd hope he'd stay for a while. It should be noted that Colonel Mosby, every night before he retired, did have a glass of red wine. And he lived until Memorial Day of 1960. So you can see the wines definitely supported him. The last question we're going to respond to came from Rue Linda. And the question was really great. If you had to choose one of your wines since you opened, what would it be? Which one would you choose from this year's harvest or the past year's harvest? And does it change from Al, Cheryl, or Sweet Amy? That's a great question and impossible to answer. All of the wines we produce, we produce because we love the wine. And we're only creating wines that we enjoy which makes winemaking extremely easy. We look at wine as a food product, so they're designed to match particular cuisines, which means that depending on what Cheryl's preparing or what we're having for a meal will dictate what we're going to be drinking. So to answer your question, I couldn't really choose any of the babies as they're all precious. Do I have one more question? Yes, so first of all, Dave said bravo on what you would serve to Mosby. And then Jim Murray down in South Carolina is asking, will wine go bad at room temperatures? Not necessarily. There's three things that'll damage wine. Fluctuating temperatures, light, and movement. That's why most cellars are in the basement where they're stable. You keep them dark to keep the ultraviolet their ultraviolet light away and the stability of the temperature is very important as fluctuating temperatures will cause a wine to be damaged. You can store wine at a room temperature but make sure the room temperature is consistent and I will admit it won't last as long as cellar temperature but it's not going to go bad right away. 
I would like to, before you proceed on, ask a follow-up of once a bottle is opened, if you're not going to consume it in a night, what would you recommend? Always refrigerate the wine, regardless of white or red. A lot of people think that a white or red should be placed on the counter and then served later. Wine is always going to stay fresher or cool. You can always let it warm up a little bit by taking it out of the refrigerator before you consume it. But please, if you have a bottle that's open, do refrigerate it. Quite frankly, Cheryl and I have never had that problem, so I'm, I'm making this assumption based on research. And speaking of research, we're now going into a new segment, which is a follow-up from last year, or last year, oh, never week. mind. Week. Last week. Last it's week. a weekly program. This <laughs> research is based on terroir. Terroir is the earth. What creates a wine? What Cheryl and I did is went out and bought two wines, one was a French and one was California, to give you some indication of the importance of terroir. Now the French wines came from an area that had rocky soil. So what I did, and you'll be able to know right away these are unfiltered whites. What I did is poured a little bit in the glass and you can see how the terroir is affecting the wine. Now obviously, like I said, these were not filtered whites. So this is the terroir. Now, the California area was known for its eucalyptus characteristics. So once again, I poured a little California wine into the glass, and you can see how the eucalyptus, which is part of the terroir, is affecting the wine. So in both instances, terroir does a significant part in making wine. Now, on a more serious note, yes, location does matter, and it's going to have a direct impact on the characteristic of a wine. Just like we talked last week, when, when we first started, Virginia was trying to duplicate California. It can't be done. Our growing seasons are different, our climate is different, some, some locations are cooler, some are hotter, some are drier, some are wetter, and the soils can be anywhere from clay to sand to stone. So all of that is going to impact the characteristic of a wine. A lot of people have asked, why did you start in Amosfield at the location? We spent two years looking for property. When we came across this particular property, we couldn't help but notice that there had been an old orchard dating over a hundred years, knowing that if you could grow orchards and apples, you could grow grapes. So we locked on to this piece of property. When you come, I know all of you have seen that, the big tree in the garden is one of the two remaining apple trees dating back over a hundred years, representing a piece of history. So all I can tell you is location does impact it, terroir, the soil, and that is more than just the soil, it's the whole package, is going to have a major impact on the production of that person's wine. Now, we're going to go to a little more history of the family. If you remember, last week we got up to November of 1971 when Cheryl and I tied the knot. Of course, I was still in the military, in the Army, and I was stationed at Fort Ritchie Site R, which is the underground command center for Congress and the White House. We had a very, very brief honeymoon, if you could call it that, uh, in December. Our, of course, our, we were married in November. In December, took a little leave. And we went up to Niagara Falls, and one of the most beautiful sights we had ever seen is the falls were all frozen. We then took a shot real quickly over to New York City and celebrated New Year's Eve on, at Times Square. A once in a lifetime opportunity, would I ever do it again? Absolutely not. But it was something we really enjoyed. At the tail end of our service, I applied and was accepted at Virginia Tech as a, for a master's degree in business. However, school started two weeks before I could get out of the Army. So 
So Cheryl drove, drove down to Blacksburg where she attended my classes for two weeks. Of course, the professors absolutely fell in love with her and were highly disappointed when I showed up to start my own education. It was a great experience, very stressful, but it turned out to be extremely rewarding. During that period of time, Cheryl worked three jobs, everything from uh, heading up the financial portion of the physics department, of which one minute they had money and the next they didn't. We'll never figure that one out. And of course, she was one of the, uh, what you saw for the? A docent. A docent for the uh, gallery. I was also a graduate assistant for one of the professors in the business school. That resulted in us getting hired by Smithfield Foods where I took on the director of marketing position and Amy reminded me one time and her children that I was the very first director of marketing for Smithfield Foods. That was back in 1971. After that, I was uh, picked up by the Postal Service. They were in the process of developing their national marketing program. They went after individuals who had business experience as well as master's degrees in business. And that's when I left Smithfield and went to work for the marketing department at the Postal Service headquarters. Of course, then we moved up to Washington. May I tell them when you were born, Amy? We might have to check the birth certificate. 1974. Oh, um, that can't uh, be possible. <laughs> followed by Al in 1976. You saw mom take that drink when dad said 1974. <laughs> Al still thinks that the bicentennial was, was actually written for him, but that's okay. When we moved to Dale City, which was in 19, to our new home in Dale City in 1979, that's when we started our first planting of vines in our backyard, where we put in Cabernet Franc, Chancellor and Chamberson. Some of those vines are actually with us today. During this entire period of time, I was making home wine with anything I could get my hands on that had sugar in it. So it kept me uh, well occupied. What we're gonna do next week is take a look at an expansion of our uh, life in the wine industry, our visit to California, the assignment I had in the Western region and the, with the Postal Service, and the beginning of a dream. We're gonna also talk about something that very, very few people are aware of, and that was the very first wine festival that at that time, Grey Ghost was known as Chateau Keller. Or Keller Crest. Keller Crest and it was our very first wine festival actually in our own backyard. Are there any questions? Uh, first of all, I would like to say to Nancy Stoltz, no, I am not 46. I have not <laughs> had my birthday yet. <laughs> Settle down, little lady. And we'll make sure that we're talking real loud um, because we have some members having a little difficulty hearing us. Are we going to our... Fun facts at Grey Ghost. Now, again, if you remember last week, we talked about the creation of the winery, the different buildings that went up, and ultimately the opening of the winery in 1994. Now let's spend a little bit of time on something that's even more important than that, and that's the vineyard development. From the beginning, one of our objectives was to create wines produced from our vineyards. That was our our commitment, which means that long before the winery was created, the vineyard started to go into production. So we first started planting in 1987 with Vidal as a major uh, planting, and then test plots of Cabernet Franc, Merlot, Cabernet Sauvignon, Chardonnay, and Riesling. Those were followed by major plantings of those. The final planting came in 2008, when we put in our Petit Verdot and Gewürztraminer. Prior to then, we were purchasing our Gewürztraminer from a little grower on the Eastern Shore, strictly by accident. They had inadvertently planted some Gewürztraminer in their, re in their Chardonnay block, asked us if we'd like it. We said yes, 
fell in love with the grape, the wine, and therefore made a commitment to plant our own. We have since been replanting certain sections of the vineyard. In 2018 was the latest replanting where we moved one of our, uh, we actually planted more diverse terminer in a block that used to be Vidal Blanc. So our intent, of course, is to increase production of that particular uh, grape. We sold our grapes earlier to two wineries. One was Linden Vineyards, and the other, other one was Hartford, Hartford, Hartwood Winery. And I should note that the 1992 Hartwood Cabernet Sauvignon was 100% Grey Ghost grapes and took the gold medal of the Virginia Governor's Cup, which we were very proud of. And Jim Livingston, who was the winemaker and owner, gave us the honor of putting our name on the label as a indication that our, our wines, our grapes actually went into that wine. Is there any questions that you have? Well, I'm gonna do something real quickly. I'm gonna revisit a question that was asked two weeks ago when Jeff, Jeff asked the question about the 2018 vintage. And the reason I'm revisiting this is I think there's something very serious that has to be passed on to you all who are watching it. And the name is three words, know your winery. After 33 years of growing grapes, Cheryl and I have learned one thing. In Virginia, you operate in a constant state of fear. If you don't operate in fear, something as bad is gonna happen. 80% of all of the problems we're gonna face in the vineyard is going to occur in the first 20% of the growing season. And if you don't recognize that, you're bound to drop the ball. Virginia was blessed with five, actually six, incredible vintages back to back, starting in 2012 and carrying right to 2017. I fear that it may have put many growers in a state that that was what they were going to expect rather than the exception. In the meantime, Cheryl and I operated as if every year was going to be a 2018, which means we threw everything we had against that to protect those vines against diseases or anything else that they were vulnerable to. As a result, the 2018 here turned out to be spectacular. But there was one other element that occurred that may have had a significant impact. It's called microclimate. That's where you have a certain area that even though it's within a general vicinity, it is going to vary significantly from areas immediately around it. In 2018, we did not get the rains that were received in Northern Virginia or down in the Charlottesville area. In fact, probably the, one of the funniest calls we used to, you got in 2018 was the uh, day we were about to harvest the Cabernet Sauvignon, individuals from Northern Virginia called and said they had had five inches of rain where we still harvesting. We had not gotten any rain that day. So yes, we went with the harvest. So it does give you some significant uh, information about the importance of location, about the importance of concentrating on quality, and the importance of putting production ahead of anything else. So we're very proud of that, and I hope that's clarified a little bit more uh, on that question. Jeff, I really appreciated it. It's given us a lot of thought. Are there any other questions? Oh, yes, I'm sorry. We do have a question. Uh, Sue, Sue asked, we like the G. When will the new Gewürz demeanor be ready? The G is ready. In fact, Amy is about to post something for you all to see, even as we speak. Don't go away though. This is just a sign for you to look at. That next week's feature is gonna be the 2019 Gewürztraminer. So get yours before happy hour. Okay, we're back on you, Al. Well, since we've come to the close of another wonderful 30 minutes, and again, I thank you all most so much for, for joining us. It's always important to end with a little humor. Nothing is better than to end an evening with everything that's going on. This gentleman was driving down one of the interstates in Virginia when his car conked out. 
he immediately was able to pull off to the median, jumped out, opened up the trunk of the car, and two guys jumped out of the back, both wearing long coats. They immediately stood in front of the car, opening their coats and exposing themselves. How were they opening their coats? They were opening their coats okay. and exposing themselves. A state trooper immediately pulled up behind and said, excuse me, sir, but what's going on? And he said, well, my car is broken down and these are my emergency flashers. Bada bing. <laughs> with that, again, thank you ever so much for being with us. We cannot begin to thank you for all your support and hope you'll continue to stay with us. We're looking forward to seeing you again next week at the sixth uh, session of the happy half hour at Grey Ghost. And I see I may have one more question. So I'm just going to comment to Nancy Stoltz as we do our closing credits that um, she asked, what did Cheryl make for dinner tonight? Uh, leftovers. Nancy, as I was walking up the stairs, I could hear them talking about what was left in the fridge and what they were going to be able to eat tonight. <laughs> we're starving. Thank you all so much for joining us. Make sure to tune in next week. And if you'd like to get your wine delivered, picked up, whatever, we love you. Here you go. That was a fast 30 minutes. <laughs>